We are A-N-N, and this is Planet Talk. Today is Sunday, March 14th. Welcome to Planet Talk. I'm your host today, Ren Butler. Yesterday, we had the inauguration of ANN. It was a, a magical event. Uh, thank you to all my colleagues who uh, gave such excellent presentations and introductions. And thank you to the people who, who came out live to support us. Uh, we will work hard in ANN to meet your astrological needs. Um, it's a really open-ended project and we look forward to sharing uh, our archetypal insights and astrological insights, celebrating important alignments and events, uh, illuminating the, the core uh, meanings within events using the lens of archetypal astrology. And uh, we also see ANN as a very important community. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you. Um, a great place to post your comments is after our videos. Uh, this is the chart for today. And uh, as yesterday, the most impressive astrological alignment uh, today is this moon, sun, Venus, Neptune. The moon is now moving out of orb, uh, but we will be within the sun, Venus, Neptune for about the next 10 days. And we can see this uh, beautifully warm, magnetic, and inspiring um, energies associated with, with this alignment. Neptune tends to inflect our feelings toward oceanic experiences, a sense of no boundaries, a higher meaning, uh, feelings of connection. The influence of Venus uh, adds a sense of aesthetic richness. Uh, we can have heightened appreciation of art and music. We can see the spiritual side of our friendships um, and really appreciate our friendships. And also Venus association with romantic experiences, this very warm and, and spiritualizing alignment will tend to create a feeling of uh, ease and seamless unity and bonding in our relationships. Um, so I hope you will all enjoy uh, those. In sessions, um, holotropic sessions uh, of various types uh, during this period, including the responsible use of uh, psychedelics, these, these archetypes will, will be a, a great help in um, creating a, a loving womb-like sense of safety during the session, before the session, and afterward, the, the bonding with friends, uh, partners after uh, uh, sessions. It will certainly increase the aesthetic richness of experiences and uh, our connection with beautiful nature. And here is the chart uh, again. Some of the other things that are happening, we, we can see the the expansive Jupiter uh, mind and uh, curiosity Mercury of this Mercury-Jupiter conjunction. This is a great time to learn and study, to broaden our minds to uh, uh, wide-ranging curiosity, a desire to see the big picture. Uh, there can be a sense of farsightedness often with Mercury-Jupiter. Uh, we're certainly in the thick of this Saturn square Uranus, which I'll be talking about in several of our uh, stories today. Uh, the uh, Texas uh, snowstorm and power outage, and also the Megan and Harry uh, interview with Oprah. Um, and also Mars trine Saturn is a helpful uh, archetypal complex for completing projects, for putting our nose to the grindstone. Saturn focuses and sustains Mars energy so that we are able to work hard in practical, efficient ways. It's a good time to get outside and, and dig in the garden uh, to work with uh, metal, glass, or stone grinding, polishing, cutting, and so on. As always, uh, you know, we need to be careful around machinery and sharp objects, uh, but uh, can, people can also be drawn to like repetitive uh, 
weight lifting or, or sort of muscle building exercises with Mars a Saturn. Now, uh, this is that I put this together and it's, uh, it's the research of uh, Stan Groff and Rick Tarnas. For those of you who are not familiar, Stan Groff uh, conducted uh, over 3000 LSD sessions with uh, voluntary uh, patients in mostly in Czechoslovakia. And uh, he found that his patients would often begin by exploring unresolved traumas and unmet needs from infancy to the present. And he calls this the biographical layer of the psyche. As self-exploration uh, deepened, uh, everyone's experiences eventually began to include experiences of uh, birth, various stages of biological birth. And these were intermixed with the human encounter with mortality and death. So birth and death, the the bookends of separate individual existence. The birth process is in a sense where the individual consciousness uh, gets funneled into a particular uh, moment in, in time and space, you know, out of the vast transpersonal realms in, into uh, an, a concrete uh, incarnation in uh, time and space. And death is again where the the divine consciousness, the universal consciousness is liberated out of the individual form and sort of like a drop of water returning to the uh, transpersonal ocean, the divine ocean. Um, and then Rick Tarnas, his uh, close friend and colleague, made the correlation uh, between the stages of the birth process uh, and the meanings of the uh, four outermost uh, planetary archetypes, uh, Neptune, Saturn, Pluto, and Uranus. I'll be revisiting this uh, many times in the, the period ahead, the, the, the weeks and uh, hopefully years ahead, and, and uh, coming at it from different angles. Um, so just for the purposes of today's uh, discussion, this highly inflected Neptune right now uh, highly activated will tend to enhance our experiences of these oceanic feelings, feelings of no boundaries, uh, feelings of security, of higher meaning, of connection in a, a good womb situation. The uh, fetus consciousness is still all over the universe. It's not really located yet in the boundaries of its body. And there's a sense of unity and peace, uh, connection with the divine, with God, with great mother goddess. These feelings will be very hard to resist for the many young uh, student visitors to Florida this week for spring break. By itself, the Sun, Venus, Neptune is almost uh, perfect for uh, um, a romantic, uh, you know, friendly, uh, in inspiring holiday by water and the sunshine, all of these, the archetypes, Sun, Venus, Neptune. Think of Brian Wilson born with Venus, Neptune, and this sort of celebration of love and the ocean and uh, the romantic feelings from early, early 60s and mid 60s in California. Um, however, we're also in the Saturn square Uranus and we're, we're still, you know, maybe two thirds of the way through this global pandemic, assuming that there are no really dangerous variants that emerge. And while many of these young visitors who are enjoying themselves in Florida may not be at imminent risk uh, of serious problems if they catch COVID, uh, though, though uh, there'll be a few that would, uh, if a, number, a high enough number of people uh, spread it there, they're very likely to take it back home and spread it to more vulnerable people, older people, maybe their own grandparents. Um, and so this is one of the uh, qualities of Saturn Uranus is like our desire for freedom meeting Saturnian consequences. And, uh, you know, health experts around the world are saying it's too soon for us to relax the mask wearing and, and the sort of precautions. Yes, the vaccines are spreading um, and everything seems to be underway, but th there are cases now spiking again in Europe 
and it could happen again here. And um, especially if some of these variants elude the defensive effects of the uh, vaccines. So uh, now one of our stories today, this in, in February, uh, a Texas snowstorm left widespread power outages and no running water for millions of people across the state of Texas. It was a, quite a remarkable uh, moment as the, the Arctic air, you know, came all the way down to Texas. Uh, the Texas governor, Greg Abbott, uh, quickly uh, went on various news uh, stations and to blame alternative energy for the problem. Ho however, uh, wind power accounts for only about 7% of Texas power supply. The real problem is that many of Texas's natural gas powered thermal plants uh, failed in the cold temperatures. Um, there, there was a kind of a, a depreciation and deterioration in the quality of, of the infrastructure in Texas. And many people say that one of the reasons is that Texas uh, wanted to maintain, you know, total privatization of its power supply. And in that, when essential services are privatized, there's no guarantee that the people who are uh, running them will look out for the greater good. Their, their essential motivation, of course, is going to be to make uh, a profit for their shareholders. And, and there's nothing wrong with making a profit, but we also have to remember what's called the second uh, bottom line, which is the social good. And many people are also saying we need really a third bottom line, which is uh, environmental sustainability. So uh, those three ethics in business, um, you know, are need to be integrated. So, you know, profit is one thing, a reasonable level of profit, but there also has to be an equal emphasis on uh, the social good and taking care of the people that that company is serving and also is it environmentally sustainable. Um, so this is in a sense the the freedom within the you know marketplace connected with Uranus also integrated with Saturnian responsibility but the Texan oil companies did not want to submit to uh, uh, federal oversight and so they they separated uh, their power grid from the rest of the country and um, the infrastructure deteriorated without that public oversight. We could perhaps see this as an expression in some ways of the negative or short-sighted side of Uranus. Uranus is the archetype, the impulse toward freedom. The desire to be different, to be unfettered, to go it alone, you know, the lone star state, slogan or motto of Texas uh, having problematic consequences, Saturn. Um, at the same time, uh, we can see the Saturnian separation from the national grid as blocking and preventing the flow of Uranian electricity to Texas in its time of need. Because they had chosen to separate themselves from the national grid to the only part of the United States that is as an independent grid. Uh, as the power supply failed, then all the natural gas powered plants failed as well as the windmills and so on. Um, that's because they weren't prepared for the cold weather, not because of anything intrinsically uh, faulty in renewable energy. Um, but because of the separation, they couldn't receive the, the Uranian electricity uh, into their grid from the states uh, outside of them. And so we can see this sort of interplay of Saturn and Uranus. The larger question also, of course, is that it's because of the burning of fossil fuels that we are facing more and more extreme weather events. And, um, uh, you know, this is a real thing. This is something that should not be politicized. This is something that all humans need to, uh, you know, have a, a rude awakening, Saturn, Uranus, uh, into is that we do need to reduce the amount of uh, carbon in the atmosphere. The parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere right now is around 415 
parts per million. And the experts tell us that we need to get that below 350 if we are going to have a viable uh, climate for uh, you know, Homo sapiens, essentially. We haven't had that much carbon in the atmosphere for uh, 800,000 years, and we're, we're quickly going beyond that. Uh, so three weeks later, uh, Governor Abbott uh, lifted the mask mandate in Texas to great uh, concern and, and criticism uh, from medical experts around the, the United States. So there's this sort of anti-masking uh, movement, conspiracy, you could say, you know, this what seems like a relatively innocuous demand to wear masks. I mean, this is different than closing businesses or closing schools. Th those are much greater hardships, but to ask people to wear a mask during a, a dangerous pandemic it does not seem to be a, a great a hardship, but uh, it has been politicized. And, you know, many people just are kind of digging in with the Iranian side of this polarity, right? Like I simply will not follow direction or I, I will not uh, give up my freedoms and so on. I think uh, a, a very deep root of this issue is perinatal. Um, the fear and resentment of wearing masks has deep perinatal roots. And I've thought of this last fall. I know other people have independently had the same insight, such as Brigitte Groff. Um, uh, partner of uh, Stan Groff. During the uh, birth process, uh, the blood supply to the uh, fetus uh, comes through um, a vein um, in the umbilical cord, and that is fed by uh, arteries wound through the uterine walls. Every time there's a contraction, that cuts or diminishes the flow of blood and oxygen to the fetus, and this is experienced as suffocation. So these contractions are absolutely necessary and essential to force the, the fetus through the narrow birth canal and out into the miracle and the ec ecstasy of new life. But during the process, it can be brought to the edge of death through this choking. And I believe that wearing masks, however innocuous it might be, reminds people of that sense of confinement and choking and I believe this is probably the deepest root of this uh, resentment about masks. The same thing happened during the uh, great smallpox epidemic at the end of World War I from, I think, like 1918 to 1920, I believe, something like that. There was a lot of resistance to wearing masks, but by about the fall of 1919, so many people were dying that the, uh, the anti-mask uh, movement uh, just faded away. Our second story is the remarkable interview that uh, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry did with Oprah Winfrey on, on March 7. And uh, this has created a a firestorm of passionate feelings and controversy, and it is it's quite an archetypal moment uh, in the history, I guess, of the royal family and the civil rights movement and, um, and so on. Many strong feelings on both sides. And uh, I, I guess what I wanna say at the outset is I'm just gonna briefly touch on this. Um, I feel like the most that any of us can do to help bridge the racial divisions in humanity is to explore our own psyches. We, we have to obviously uh, have laws and rules, protocols that are fair and equitable for all human beings. Um, one of the issues is you know, what is the fastest and most effective way to go from where we are now as a human species to a hopeful future where we can live in harmony and respect each other's differences and respect diversity and pluralism. And uh, I believe that as well as whatever, um, you know, edu outer education that uh, people are drawn to put forth and the sort of consequences of negative behaviors, you know, the consequences of those, it will be very helpful 
uh, as more human beings uh, do deep exploration in their own psyches. And I'll talk more about that uh, as we go. This is a very interesting uh, bi-wheel chart. It's called Meghan Markle's chart here is in the center. And then these were the transits uh, on March 7th. I wasn't sure where it happened. I just put in New York, but that won't affect uh, anything that I'm about to mention. Now, it's uh, very interesting that uh, one of the most dominant transits that Meghan Markle has had for about the last uh, four uh, years ha has been transiting Pluto square her natal Pluto. This is a very heavy and intense transit. It can bring up, bring up very deep issues from the psyche, almost with volcanic force. It's very hard to hold that energy in. Uh, our society does not deal well with Plutonic energy, or, or rather the, uh, the liberation of unconscious contents that Pluto is trying to if affect. And I would imagine that being in uh, the kind of spotlight and the protocols and traditions of her life in London uh, and in England would have been uh, very confining and not the ideal uh, place for her to be. Now, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in the sky for, uh, for about two years was also in square with her natal Pluto. So Pluto-Saturn in the sky has been this incredible hard birth labor contraction bearing down on humanity for the last several years and especially in uh, 2020 with the pandemic. But many people are feeling the sense of constriction, compression, oppression, the, the fear of the shadow side of the human psyche that uh, many people saw Donald Trump uh, personifying. Uh, uh, not only that, but she had that squaring her natal Pluto. So she had like Saturn Pluto in two different ways in the in the, the world transits and by personal transit. And I think that she's probably come through one of the most difficult periods of her life. So the ideal with these transits would, would be for people to do systematic Saturn deep Pluto processing of their unconscious contents in a safe way. And I do not mean like going to a psychiatrist or some other medical professional and just suppressing the symptoms. In order to get the most out of these processes, we have to allow the opening and the releasing uh, that is trying to happen, what's called abreaction of unconscious energies and emotions. And uh, um, she was more likely with the Saturn Pluto square Pluto and without the chance to process to uh, feel the, the second perinatal matrix that Groff talks about, basic perinatal matrix two, BPM two, a sense of no exit, of being stuck, encaged, entrapped, uh, judged, um, you know, persecuted, uh, undermined. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean that there weren't actual events in the outer life that, that confirmed that or her reminded her of those earlier birth imprints, uh, but it's certainly a very difficult time. So, uh, you know, great news for her. Uh, some, a great deal of the pressure has eased off. I would say maybe two thirds. Uh, so there's a rough guess, you know, by looking at the transits, but it would still be a good time as it is for all of us to, uh, if we feel inner pain to, to seek out people who can help us process that, uh, responsible therapists, guides, sitters, uh, and so on. Um, and that also goes for uh, people in positions of power or fame, like you know, even the royal family. Um, we're all in this together. You know, I, I don't want to take a, a position on this so much as just look at it archetypally and you know, this is a one of those growth promoting opportunities. And certainly the members of the royal family, I know this is probably a very difficult time for some of them. Um, and uh, there's always that option for doing that kind of deeper uh, self-exploration work. 
you know, that might not happen in this generation, but <clears throat> certainly for all of us looking in on the story, uh, following our own emotions down to their deeper cores. And uh, some of these are perinatal and some are transpersonal in origin. And I will talk more about that in just a moment. It's interesting that she also had has transiting Uranus square her natal sun, Mercury, especially the Uranus to the sun. This is a three-year transit. She's about halfway through that, maybe two-fifths. This can be a time of, of irrepressible individuation, of breaking free, of finding one's own voice, the Uranus transiting to natal Mercury, of uh, speaking out for freedom and diversity, of, uh, you know, non-conformism, uh, celebrating one's uniqueness, um, and so on. So uh, that would certainly fit. Uh, I would also mention that transiting Saturn is in opposition to her natal sun, Mercury. Uh, the sense of weighty responsibility, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, being careful with one's words would fit that this and the, the sort of backlash and the, the judgment upon her by many people uh, many people in on the sort of far right in the United States or the right wing of the United States uh, especially seemed and in Britain seem to have uh, see her in a much more negative light than they did before the interview in the sense of being judged or uh, condemned would certainly fit that Saturn opposition sun. Um, There's a, a very happy picture of uh, Prince Harry and Meghan. Uh, a number of commentators have made the comparison uh, between them and the uh, King Edward who abdicated, abdicated uh, his throne. Uh, I believe it was, was it 1936? Uh, uh, several years before World War II um, because he was in love with Wallace Simpson, an American commoner. And uh, the, the kind of inertia and tradition and uh, prejudice that Megan is talking about in her experience in the royal family, uh, you know, it, at least in the 1930s, certainly applied also to... to um, commoners, people without some kind of uh, royal title. I'll be looking at their their composite chart in just a moment. And uh, in two weeks for my next segment, I would like to look at the composite of uh, uh, King Edward and uh, Wallace Simpson. Unless one of my colleagues uh, wants to do it first, that would be uh, equally uh, great. So here is Megan's chart. Um, so one of the things that stands out is this Mars uh, square uh, Jupiter Saturn moon. Now, the moon Saturn can indicate feeling uh, cut off from one's family or alienated from one's family. There's a term in astrology for moon Saturn, like wax receive, like marble retain. <clears throat> People can be hurt. Uh, especially when they're young with Moon Saturn, they're very susceptible to feeling judged or criticized or uh, not accepted within their families. Uh, the Moon inflects uh, the experience toward our, our sense of our families. So this is quite painful, uh, can be for, for people, but it, there's a real positive side to it. Uh, it helps people to grow. They have a strongly developed conscience. Um, they can be very honest about their feelings and so on. Um, and there's often people develop a sense that they need Saturn to do deep inner moon work. Um, that, that certain problems won't go away by themselves and they have to do the deep self-exploration. Um, of course, she has Jupiter there too, which can bring mitigating circumstances. And uh, there's another side of her childhood, which probably would have been experienced as happy and bountiful and, and so on. Uh, one of the criticisms uh, from people, especially those who, you know, really love the, the royal family, um, is that, you know, she has every privilege that you could have. You know, she's very attractive. She's wealthy. Uh, 
I, I suppose, uh, many opportunities and, and yet she's complaining. So sort of the, seeing her as a moon Jupiter person, you know, having everything, but not being satisfied with it. But, you know, the things that she's talking about, um, uh, maybe judgments from family members this cuts through all of that and, and it doesn't matter how much you have but even more so when we have wounds on the inside it doesn't matter what our outer life is like we just simply are going to be dominated from the inside by these inner wounds and traumas and uh, you know i'm i'm not saying that that she was that all the trauma that could be associated with this moon saturn could be uh, associated with it come from her experience uh, with Harry's family not at all I mean there's almost certainly going to be deeper wounds from earlier times and that would then deepen down into the the perinatal memory of being constricted and then there could be transpersonal roots this would be just general way of looking at an aspect like this now Mars squaring it adds a kind of militant quality to it mars saturn there can be feelings of resentment like smoldering pressure and anger it doesn't just blow up uh, the moon mars can also indicate uh, like family squabbles family anger um, without saturn there it would tend to sh you know there might be a, some yelling or processing and then people might feel better but saturn is that inertia that holds things in place and it's like a cold boil and there can often be like feelings of acrimony or bitterness or even desires for revenge with the mars saturn so so one of the issues is many people see her as a, a champion of civil rights and a, a, a fierce uh, defender of her, her freedom and, and as an activist. And this would also show up from the Mars square Jupiter. People can often be effective activists. They can put their ideals, Jupiter, into action. The issue for many is, is a public interview like the one with Oprah, the, will that lead to the quickest uh, overall heart opening among everyone concerned that that everyone wants to happen or will it create in many or in some people a backlash which will then slow down the process of heart opening and i don't think any of us can answer that question we all have to play our part in history with and do the best that we can with what's happening you know around us and right in front of us and and she and harry felt that it was important to speak out and 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 that's where we are at this point so that's just a some of the elements from her chart now here's here they are during the interview and here's prince harry's chart and just very briefly he also has a moon saturn opposition that uh so again there can be that highly developed conscience uh inner reserve um and also sometimes uh, family moon problems of course many moon saturn people have have happy family lives so it there's a variety of possible expressions you will still always see saturn in the mix in some way that could be the more positive side of saturn and many people would applaud his integrity in in, in this particular situation he also has sun square mars that the kind of heightened yang energies when we see him in his uh his military uniform it, it kind of fits in certain ways he looks good in the uniform uh many would would say um he, he has that kind of manly strong uh leader uh quality about him in general um it's interesting that he has sun square neptune highly idealistic uh, a visionary a dreamer um you know somebody who would sort of be looking toward a more ideal world as opposed to just accepting uh, the status quo this is a composite chart of the charts of uh, prince harry and Meghan markle it's a, a midpoint chart um the, the midpoint between their two suns becomes the the uh, composite sun the midpoint between their two moons the composite moon and then we look at this as a chart of the relationship itself 
And it's very interesting. Uh, the sun is almost exactly square Uranus in this composite chart. They Neither of them has a major sun-Uranus aspect. Uh, in combination, uh, they do have, have the sun square Uranus. And we would expect a relationship uh, with the quality of nonconformism, of individuation, of uh, urges toward freedom and emancipation, uh, rebellion um, would certainly uh, fit that. And would sort of bring in the Uranian um, traditional Aquarian meanings of uh, universal brotherhood and sisterhood, equality, uh, civil rights, and so on would be a major focus in their relationship. They also have Moon square Saturn Pluto in the composite chart uh, because she has the conjunction and uh, Harry has the opposition. They end up with the square in the uh, uh, composite chart. So it's not just Moon Saturn, it's Moon Saturn Pluto. So this would certainly tend to inflect their experience toward challenges in the family in some way, uh, a very serious, deep involvement with emotional process, emotional problems with psychology. And they, I mean, to, for me, the best case scenario would be that they become involved in some kind of deep, uh, safe self-exploration technique and begin this process of uh, uncovering the unconscious contents. I believe that that will help not only them, but also the royal family, their family. The work that we do not only benefits ourselves, but also helps the people in our lives. And um, this sort of unilateral decision to, to undergo the inner archaeological quest, I believe, is a very responsible thing that each of us can do. And so they may find that they're kind of compelled into that. Um, the sense of pressure and difficulties in the outer world that then press in that sense that certain outer doors may be closed, but the inner door of self-exploration is always open and is in a way beckoning us at all times. And I would see that their relationship is a kind of barometer of the culture in general. So this, there are other elements to this chart, but we'll leave it uh, there. Well, except the Jupiter conjunct Uranus, certainly the sense of uh, Jupiter amplifying and expanding the, the Uranus archetypes impulses toward individuation and, and separation out of the, you know, conformist uh, tradition um, and so on. Also the potential embrace of new and innovative technologies, uh, exciting forms of activism, and so on. So this is my final slide, and I just want us just a little bit of an overview. So Rick Tarnas put this together, and this is a very profound uh, schema or map model, uh, um, and it shows the influence of Groff's uh, systems of condensed experience, or what Groff calls coex systems. These are memory systems in our unconscious. We, we all have uh, these memory systems, both positive ones and negative ones. And how we feel at any given time is, is largely dependent on which of these memory systems within us is activated, where the flashlight of consciousness is pointed. And that's not something that we can control. Uh, you know, moods shift and that's, you know, feelings change. And that's because the flashlight, for whatever reason, often it's because of changing astrological transits, uh, moves to another memory system. And then suddenly we're back in that, mem that part of our lives and we see the universe uh, through the stencil of those memories. And so, this is the biographical layer, layer of the unconscious from infancy to the present. These, these memory systems would then deepen into a connection in one of the uh, basic perinatal matrices, the BPM-1, the, the womb state, BPM-2, the, the more Saturnian no exit stage of labor with the cervix closed, the uh, death rebirth process uh, connected with Pluto and BPM3 this, with the cervix now open and the propulsion down the birth canal 
and then BPM4, the ecstatic liberation and crowning as we exit the life-threatening birth canal and enter uh, the delivery room as a, as a new, uh, newborn. And then our memory systems don't end there. They can often, often have deeper transpersonal roots. The most common are ancestral memories, mythological experiences, uh, karmic memories, this would be past life experiences, uh, collective memories, and others. And, and then the archetypes, kind of the, the, the sort of the uh, cosmic principles that are informing all of these different nuances of experience and correlated with the, uh, the planets in the solar system, uh, in alignments between the planets in the solar system. And so, again, I just want to say that this, this has been a very painful time, both for Megan and Harry, and also for uh, the royal family, and also for many people watching in. And, uh, you know, we're all in this together. If, if, you know, marriage and family counselor therapists would be looking would be looking at this as a family issue. Yes, there are profound sociological and uh, political and historical elements to, to th these racial problems that have been exposed, um, you know, pr uh, po you know uh, prejudices and so on. Um, but there's a layer at which the only happy solution of this can be a kind of reconciliation you know uh, grandchildren need their grandparents and you know their their son will benefit greatly from connection with his that side of the family uh, but maybe they've made the decision that it's it's just too toxic or too negative in some way but i i hope that's not the case uh, there were some beautiful pictures of 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 her and harry and and uh, you know the other members of the royal family uh and, and they just it just looked wonderful and i i just thought she added so much to the family and it really is a, a loss you know it's a shame because that would have done so much to enrich the kind of um reputation the accessibility of 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 that family, you know, to the larger world in the, the changing uh, world that we live in. But, you know, we can still hope that for that kind of reconciliation. I want to conclude with my thoughts again about the Saturn square Uranus in the sky right now. It really lends itself to extremism, to kind of fanatical points of view, uh, all or nothing, uh, us, them, or right wrong um people can identify solely with the saturnian side of the the polarity they might identify with tradition with long-standing ways of doing things and and resist change resist the uranian side of it or they might identify solely with the uranian side of it and see everyone else as uptight and repressive or, or everyone outside of their, their group, and they want to make rapid, rapid change. And we have, to ident we have to integrate both sides of that polarity. So it, it, in, when it's integrated, it manifests as responsible freedom, incremental liberation. There can be uh, these kind of hard collisions of different planes of experience under Saturn Uranus world transits like we have right now for the next uh, three years and and that certainly it was an evident was evident with this interview and uh, you know sometimes rude awakenings are, are what is needed and uh, that the universe certainly does give those to us um, but the the real issue is how, how are all the hearts involved going to open and that means mine everyone involved in the sociological civil rights family drama that is unfolding with this story several types of experience bear special relevance to our discussion today and that are uh, ancestral memories and collective memories 
Groff found that uh, when people have these kinds of experiences, uh, for example, collective memories, uh, Caucasians can experience very vivid sequences from the African slave trade. They can identify with slaves suffering in the, the slave boats and plantations. Um, they can identify with Jews uh, dying in the concentration camps or First Nations people dying of uh, smallpox or, or genocide. These experiences help us to have compassion for other people. We realize that we are all part of one fabric of consciousness and we can't do anything to any group without doing it to ourselves and they they lead to tremendous compassion and understanding for uh, racial issues and they also have the sense of lifting karma it, it doesn't you can't prove it um, but there's a subjective feeling that you're helping the problem in some way by reliving and working through these traumas um, the karmic experiences, past life experiences, I believe, are even more rare or are quite a bit rarer. Um, but what people realize that they, they aren't one race in every lifetime, that we alternate in different genders, different races, different socioeconomic situations through a succession of lifetimes. And that our soul is learning by having all the different varieties and possibilities of experience and those those kind of experiences also greatly expand our sense of you know who we are and what our true identity is and they greatly diminish the sense that you know i am caucasian it's more like i am part of the human field that is having many experiences in over time and so these are very beneficial uh, experiences for people in a civilization to have, and I believe will help greatly uh, with the challenges that we are facing. So I want to conclude uh, by just looking at, at the, our website here. It's, again, it's archetypalnews.net, and here I'm on the programs tab. So I will see you in two weeks. Uh, for Planet Talk. Next Sunday, my colleague Lisa Virginia will be doing the Planet Talk. Tomorrow is your Astrological Weather Report with James Moran. Art Granoff will be doing World Transits today on Tuesday. Chris McNulty uh, will be here Wednesday. Alex Stein on Thursday. Uh, Chad Harris will be doing every second week Archetypes in the News. Uh, Bill Street every second week Planet Talk. Um, and we'll be hearing from some of these maestras, uh, Becca Tarnas, Laura Machete, and Saffron Rossi in the uh, weeks ahead. And then you can put in your calendar the, this uh, full moon in Libra on March 28th, Danielle Meyer. Uh, and you can see uh, several other ones coming up. Um, we hope those will be live streams during the exact lunation. To stay tuned. The, the best place to keep up is on the uh, Facebook group, Archetypal Astrology and Transpersonal Psychology. It's been a real honor to speak with you today. Uh, wishing you the very best several weeks. Happy Daylight Savings Time. Happy Spring. Uh, and I'll talk to you soon.